Hey everybody, welcome to Faith and Culture. Glad to bring you another episode as we look into the issues of, of course, our faith and how they apply in our culture. And part of what we want to be able to do is bring you some of our very own staff and personnel. And today we have our very own Pastor Chad Bickley. Pastor Chad, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Glad to have you. And hey, tell us a little bit about your upbringing and even how you came to faith. And then I'll, I'll ask you some more questions after that. Yeah, yeah. I, I was blessed to be in a Christian home. Uh, grew up in Wisconsin. Big time Packers fan, Brewers fan, Bucks fan, Badgers fan. Yeah. Um, my, dad, my dad was a farmer. He was a coach. He was an athletic director. He was a youth pastor. He was head of maintenance. He could do, he could do pretty much anything. But uh, uh, I have three older brothers and so we, I've been in church my whole life, part of, part of the church. And uh, when I was six years old, I remember I was in kindergarten, and my teacher was talking about heaven and hell, and I didn't want to go there to hell. And I remember going outside and overlooking a gym floor, and that's when I became a Christian, was baptized. Um, uh, long story short, but when I was in the fifth grade, we moved to California, and uh, my dad took a job at a, at a Christian school and grew up there and then eventually went on to Christian Heritage College where I met you. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> where I led you to the Lord. I thought I led you to the Lord, but that's well, fine. That's, that's okay. No, nah, that's uh, fine. So your teacher literally scared the hell out of you, it sounds like. Is that what happened? I mean, she, yeah, and she I, gave you the... I grew up in a pretty strict environment and definitely said the prayer a lot of times, but I had to come to a point where I was like, you know what? God saved me when I was six. What and, was it about the gym? You said you over, you were overlooking a gym. Was that just yeah? Kind I'm of a where big. I was big it? into sports, and it was just the time, and it was just a reminder of of um, you know I spent a lot of time uh, in a gym, uh, played basketball, coached basketball for the past 25 years. Um, I was in administration um, at Santa Fe Christian, and oversaw just a massive athletic department um, from K through 12. We had, we had about 96 teams and 140 coaches. And uh, so just learned a lot going through all that, but sports has played a massive, massive part in my life. And you mentioned your dad and he was a farmer. And early on, what was it about kind of that upbringing in the Midwest and Wisconsin that kind of really – those values stick with you today, and what were some of those? I mean, work ethic. I mean, yeah. watching him do, you know, yeah, you, you had to put the, the farm never rested, right? And so there really were no days off, and the cows had to be milked in the morning and at evening. And then he transitioned into a trucking business, and and I remember that's a lot of times I spent time with my dad and my older brothers is we were working with them, and so. He taught us the value of work, and he taught us uh, so much about leadership and what that looks like. And um, so, I mean, he played a massive, massive role in my life. And so you, you grew up in that environment. You guys moved to California, which was Santa Maria, California, and, and you are at a Christian school there, and your dad is kind of doing everything there for a while, right? I mean, as far as maintenance, coaching... All that. Yeah, one time he was athletic director, head of maintenance. He coached three sports. He was youth pastor. Um, pretty much drove the bus, and pretty much did everything. So he showed that work ethic, and then to raise money, mm -hmm. he did a side business that many of us here at the church are the benefactors of a special seasoning that he makes. Yeah. <laughs> but so he did a side business. Tell, he, talk about that a little bit. I mean, he, he just has a find a way, make a way attitude and, and the athletic department didn't have much money. And so you had to raise your own money. And so Santa Maria is known for their barbecue. So he created this spice and, um, and then, and then built a, took a bus and built a kitchen out of it <laughs> and then, then built a, a, a barbecue pit that was hydraulic and literally fed 800 people on a weekend, and that's how he he didn't he didn't pay himself or anything. It all went to the athletic department, and as a result of that, I mean, my senior trip was to England 
uh, my wife, who I met in the fifth grade. Her senior trip was to Australia. Like, he would take us on mission trips. And um, so he would fund, he not only funded the sports through that, but he took kids on experiences that, you know, we'll never forget. That's incredible. And then, so you come to uh, Christian Heritage College, and um, we had an incredible coach there, Art Wilmore, and some of the, the values that he had shaped us and shaped you, certainly. And what were some of those? Because you become a coach later, and those values that coach instilled in us. And just for our viewers and listeners, Chad and I went to college together and uh, played basketball together, won a couple of national championships basketball-wise, um, NCCAA, and that's Christian College National Championships, big deal, and it was pretty awesome. Yeah, <laughs> pretty awesome. But our coach was amazing yep. in shaping us in terms of our um, uh, spiritual foundations, but really it was about servanthood for our coach. He wanted us to be incredible competitors, but also wanted to serve, have a mindset of leading people to the Lord and serving. So what were some of the values, though, that you took with you into coaching from there? I, I would say, I mean, and you can relate to this, is, you know, ministry and life and is difficult, and he was tough. And I've always said if I made it through four years of Coach Wilmer, make it through anything. Yeah. And um, he was hard. I mean, he, but he loved, I knew he loved us, and I knew he wanted the best for us. And so as he pushed us, because my dad pushed us as well, and so I understood that where some people couldn't handle that. And, um, but I knew where he was coming from, and ultimately after making through, through those four years, I mean, I think we learned the, the value of being a teammate, the value of you taking a passion that you have and, and using it for the Lord, because we went on multiple mission trips. Um, man, we, would, we took some tough ones I mean, in the heart of Mexico, and it was it, there was some hard things. But at, when you look back, it's like those are the things that shaped us into who we are today. And that one in Mexico, tell that story a little bit, because Coach, passionate about reaching people of Christ, is in an arena full of people, and he's trying to preach the gospel about heaven and hell. And they started chanting, like, in well, tell us the they were... <laughs> The whole play, I mean, we're in an arena, and he's he's given the gospel, and he's like, where do you want to go, heaven or hell? And the whole crowd's just started chanting, infierno, and we're like... Which means hell. Yeah, <laughs> and then he got more mad. He's like, no, you can't go to hell, because... And, and we're like, coach, man, relax, man. We got to get out of here. So it was just... He was so passionate about the Lord, and to see him in that environment, like, yeah. never backing down, I mean, it was like... You know, he cared for those people, and it was like, it, no, you can't go to hell. And so, but we were scared for our lives. Yeah. <laughs> and then, so you, you finish up uh, college, and um, somehow Kelly says yes to you yep. and marries she did. you. And then from there, you got a coaching job pretty quick, right? I got a coaching job in Hesperia, California, um, right out of college. And I don't know, I just always had passion to coach and teach. And so I went to a Christian school up there and then you followed me <laughs> two years later and came up. High desert, baby. <laughs> High desert. And, uh, and then three years into it, I went back to their college and coached with a former teammate for four years where I learned so much. And then you followed us back down here <laughs> And then church. from there, I went to Santa Fe Christian, where uh, I was there 16 years. And uh, when, when I came back down, you and Kelly helped us start yeah. our church. It's pretty fascinating. I mean, when you look at it and, and um, you know, we, you asked us to help, and Kelly helped with the children's, and I just did whatever you told me to do. And, um, <laughs> but it was a startup church, and... And so through those years, it's, 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 for me, it's crazy to see where it started and where it is now. Um, but just even through those years, and then we moved to North County, and then it moved to Lakeside. We helped a little bit while I was at Lakeside and then transitioned out. But um, I just think through all the, the relationship that, that we had, we'd always talk about each other's situations mm -hmm. and kind of just like, hey, this is what I'm going through, and you're going this way. And it was like, Looking back, it's just like, man, that's weird how God started to prepare that. Yeah. So I think when this all happened, it was pretty seamless. Yeah. 
So you're coaching at Sperry, you come back down here, you're at Santa Fe, and you, you have this passion for coaching, you're a great coach, but there was just something maybe missing in each team. Like there was an element of, I mean, you guys always were in so many ways, you, you never recruited like so many other schools, yeah. but yet you were always competitive, always right in every game. But to get over the top, it was like there was something missing and you found it over time. Yeah, it's, it's amazing what, what God takes your passions and turns it into different passions. So I had a passion for basketball. Uh, about nine years ago, I fell in love with culture. And, and the reason was because I, I had a passion. It's like, I just, you know, if, if you're a Christian school, you should represent the best. Like when you walk onto the floor, you shouldn't get beat by 50 and then say, hey, other team, you want to pray? Like to me, <laughs> that's just not who yeah. I am. And because I, I think other people look at you like, oh, they're nice little boys. Yeah. You know, I'm like, ah, that's not for me. And so, so I was like, man, how do we compete? Because I want to play against the best teams and, and I want to win consistently. So how do you do that? So I spent just a ton of time, and the, the amount of people got put in my life and the books and different things was about culture. And it's like, man, you got, do you have a vision? What's your mission? What, how, how are you aligned with how you behave? And honestly, it completely took the pressure off of winning because now you're focusing on, okay, this is my expectations. This is what we do. This is what we're all about. And then you teach that to a group of people, and then all of a sudden you get the right people to fall into that arena right and so when I had when I was when I was athletic director I was like okay okay I, I didn't want it like I was like no god I don't want this and then I went into it very hesitantly um and and I'm I'm in charge of you know 140 some coaches and 90 teams I'm like how are we going to do this oh it's culture we got to have everybody's got to be looking at the same thing all the time and so it worked. I mean, it, it, it worked, and we defined it, and we spent all our time defining, correcting, encouraging, teaching what we're all about. And if you, know, if you don't want to be a part of that, you can go to the school next door. That's okay. We're, we're okay with that. But it attract, what, I, what I found through it, it attracted the right people yeah. in the right spots. See, that's what I think is the big difference. When you think about so many high school programs today, it's a lot of coddling. It's mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, maybe talent on, on the court and parents input saying they got to play, they got to do this. How have you um, dealt with that at Santa Fe? Which, you know, honestly, from, the out, from people on the outside would look at a Santa Fe Christian and think, not accurately, but they would think, oh, that's one of those schools. They're yeah. privileged. And yeah. so I bet the coach has to, give in to this and to that. Well, how have you defined cultures in such a way that that doesn't happen there? I think it goes with rhythms and it, and it goes, we, we teach our parents, you know, we get them to buy into the long game. And, and if you don't buy into the long game, you know, right now it's all about my kid needs to play. My kid needs to get a college scholarship. My, my kid needs this, this, and this. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. When the adversity hits, they, they want to jump in. And it's like, no, let them go through the adversity. The adversity is the best thing that ever happened to them. Mm -hmm. and, and, I've, and, and it's getting them to buy in to what our program's about. And that is taught through the rhythms of what we do. Then it's taught with the kids through Bible studies, through uh, goals, through you know, being a team. And it's an everyday thing. And that's the part about culture that I've studied and different things. And that's been amazing, and to see where it is is like, oh my goodness! And then to see it translate here is like, you know, it, it just it, it it blows my mind to be honest. And I think that's the thing that when people listen to this and you know, they're watching it and they're going, you know, they have a business or they they lead something, and they hear this idea of yeah, everyone has to have a vision statement, mission statement. Everybody's heard that, right? And then all these businesses and people and leaders they put it up on the wall. Ah, oh, that's our mission statement. But that that doesn't do it. So what have you learned over time that makes the difference between having a vision statement? Like that saying is, you know, is what's on your walls happening down your halls? I think I think for me, you you trust that it's gonna work, but when it does work, then you come to a point where you go, I'm gonna fight for this because I know it works. Yeah. And I'm at that point right now that I've seen what it's done. So I'm I'm just a massive believer. If you get 
everybody pointing in the right direction, it, it, you can accomplish whatever, whatever you want. And being a coach, I believe a coach translates because a coach can't score one point on the floor. And so he's got to train and teach and do this because he can't go do the, the job on the court of what the players got to do. And if the coach, you know, you get into a business and different things, you got different roles on the team. And if the head guy is like, no, I'm going to, I can do that. And they jump in, they start doing that. You, you become very small. You don't grow to the, to the point you need to grow. Yeah. And so at, at Santa Fe, like when I think about, again, some people thinking it's a privileged place and you can't, you can't speak directly to the kids. Part of culture is you, you have to have those hard conversations. And so, um, you know, a lot of coaches might just want to coach. I just want to coach basketball. I'm not going to care about all that. I want a bunch of talent. At the end of the day, I just want a bunch of talent. And it, but it's a huge effort. So you got to call kids out. And sometimes, I mean, talk about that a little bit of how you, you, directly, even yeah. recently, a practice, you know, this isn't it. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it's like, obviously, you got to build that trust. Yeah. And you got to build that culture. And you got, you got to let them see you outside the, the, the court and like, oh, he's a fun guy or whatever. But if, if you get a group of people to buy in to the vision, and so what I do at the beginning is like, okay, tell me your goals. You guys define your goals. Because when you hand me your goals, you're going to tell me how, how you want to be coached. So when they hand me the goals, I look at them, oh, you want to win an open championship? Okay, I'm going to coach you that way. Are you good with that? And so when they know why you're coaching them in a certain way, they're going to respond. So when I say you're selfish right now, you're in a bad mood, they, they literally, they catch themselves and they, they change. I love 16, 17 year old kids because they, they, they listen to you. Like, like kids will, if you put expectations on them, they'll change. And, um, but it's when, when people come in and protect them and like, no, this is okay. It's, it's just like, no, let them go through that. And so at the end of the day, you got to have hard conversations. If a kid walks in and he's, and he's got a bad attitude and he looks tired, you call him out on that because, because they want you to call them out because they're the ones who handed me the goals. Mm. And so then I say, well, you guys handed me goals. If you go back and change your goals, Okay, and then come back and hand to me, then I'll change my coaching style. <laughs> so they're bought in to, because they want to experience that. Have you had any kids come with, with very low goals? That, you know, uh, I, I think we need to win eight games this year out of 30. Not I mean, anymore. Yeah. Eight, 10, 11 years ago, they, they only saw, they didn't see where we could go. But now that we've been to where <laughs> we want to go, they, it, they can see the light right every single year and then they know the the program's not about them right it's about all the people in the past and once you explain that it's like well it's not about you it's about carrying on this tradition and and the great thing about culture is culture passes it along to the next generation mm -hmm. and so once you start to teach this group they start to teach the younger group. And if you're spending all your time trying to teach the younger group and this group and this group, it's like, no, that doesn't work. The, whoever reports to me, we're teaching you, but it's your responsibility to teach them and model what our program's all about. Speak to the statement. I think Deion Sanders made this statement that, you know, coaches say, today's kids have changed so much and I can't coach these kids today. And, and that kids haven't changed, coaches have changed. I think, I think coaches have changed and I think parents have changed. You know, I mean, I mean, I grew up with a dad that if I ran to him and complained that I wasn't playing, he'd say, well, go work harder. Yeah. And so you can always find someone to listen to you. And so if you as a parent aren't, aren't ch challenging your kids or, or you can encourage them in the midst of adversity, but if you jump in and take their adversity for them, then, then they're ultimately going to struggle, in my opinion. And, and so at the end of the day, again, it goes back to kids want to be taught. Kids want high expectations. And then if they don't, they'll filter out because yeah. you don't want kids in the culture that don't want high expectations because one person can, can take down a team. And you mentioned that recently when we were talking about how 
you know, some, some kids, they don't go all in with your program. And so they'll come to you and say, well, I got this vacation or I got this going on. What is your response? You have a good player. Yeah. I mean, a, a, a difference maker. And he says, I can't go to that practice. I, I, I'm not going to be here that week. Yeah, I, I, you again, you set the expectation, right? <clears throat> and so when a, when a play, and this is before the season, but if, it's, if a player, and this has recently happened, if a player comes to you and like, hey, coach, I want to play, but I got two, two vacations. And I'm like, well, enjoy those vacations. Because if I let you go, you know, sometimes you look at the individual and you want, you know, yeah, I want you to play, but you know what, this might not be for everybody. Right. And then, then he came back. He's like, coach, I got one vacation. I'm like, well, you can enjoy that vacation, you know, until you have zero vacations and you don't miss, you know, there's, there's a great quote. You can have anything, but you can't have everything. Yeah. And so that's what I want to teach our guys is like, and, and honestly, the, this, it all translates everywhere. And that's where it's very exciting to me. Um, just because coming to Skyline, I was like, ah, I don't know, God, I don't know. And he took me through an unbelievable process. But coming here, it's like, man, all that stuff translates. It, it works here. It works in a business. It works at a school. You know, it works in a family. You just got to gotta have high expectations. You got to explain them. And then you got to coach them to them. So for, coming here for you was a big step of faith for you in when I first – we started talking about it. One, I saw what you were doing with culture and how that was huge um, and the difference that it makes. It made so much sense to me that that would translate into a church environment, a pretty large staff that we have. What was kind of the process for you of trying to determine, is, is, this, is this what the Lord's calling me to do at this time? And Yeah, you, you would call and kind of plant seeds, and I would laugh, and I'd be like, I was comfortable. I mean, my family was all at Santa Fe, you know, I definitely did not want to work with you because um, <laughs> you don't want to be stretched. I know. Just, it's fine. just a lot of, you know, that's a different <laughs> podcast. But, uh, you know, when you just I remember you said we have a mutual friend, Jack Hamilton, who is your former executive pastor and and um, just we're very close with him. And he said you, you told me, he said, just come down for one lunch. And I'm like, fine, I'll come down for one lunch. And I was convinced in my heart driving down here that Jack's going to be like, no, no, no. Because I knew Jack knew where I was yeah. and what was going on there. And so I remember we were all talking and we we're in uh, down the second floor. And, and uh, I was like, I was actually giving answers because trying not to get the job. And I was like, this is all I would bring, this. I don't know this, 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 or this, but I do know this, and that's it. And so, um, and afterwards, I remember Jack looking at us and like, this could work. And I was like, what? And so long story, but I remember it was 45 days of God. Like it was, I, I, you know, I believe calling, it goes with your passion, right? And I believe sports and coaching and basketball, that was easy for me. This was completely different. And so I'm like, it was through that 45 day process where I was like, man, I knew I was called here. And I knew the importance of that because I remember sitting in a meeting and I got all these pastors and they're looking at me like I'm their boss. And I'm like, I didn't care because I knew God had me here yeah. because of the 45 day process that he put me through. It was wild. It, it was, it was wild. And I remember the last thing that happened and I was walking to my car and it wasn't like, it wasn't this joy walking to my car. It was like, Oh my goodness, I'm going to Skyline. And and it was just like, okay, God, fine, I'll do it. <laughs> and that, that probably that sense of responsibility is part yes. of that that hits you. And you know, um, in trying to determine coming here, that's a big part of it. Because the calling is what keeps you when times get tough. When yep. I talk to church planters, there so many people think about planting a church, want to plant a church. So are you called to plant a church though? Because of how hard it is, and if you're not called to it, you'll give up pretty easy. And so you have to take that time ahead of time to, to pray and see if God is calling you to that. And that's for people out there too. If you're thinking about a job change, change of moving from the state, like so many people are doing from California, like, is this what God's calling me to do? Because when it gets tough, when it gets uncomfortable and you're not used to all these things, I know God called me there. 
And that's one of the things you and I talked about quite a bit is you were here and it was outside your comfort zone in terms of here I am at a church serving at a church now, like all the time. And it's different, but it's what God's called me to do. And so that's what's kept you in all that. And I, I just encourage people with that, just like, man, make sure God's calling you to do that next thing, because no matter how tough it is, you're going to stick with it and see the blessings of that too. And that's what's been happening. You, you're coming up on four years, and it's been incredible to see that culture, what you bring with culture and helping our staff understand the importance of culture, keeping us all focused on that goal. That's not just something we say once in a while. You don't just, you know, hey, let's say this and all right, let's go. You know, we're going to have service on Sunday. I'll see you at staff meeting. But what a lot of people don't know is all the one-on-one -on -one meetings that you constantly have and then that everyone else constantly has with people that work with them. Talk about that process a little bit and the importance of it. Yeah, I think, I think once you develop a culture, you got to define it. And I know you and I worked on that, and it was, it was, that was so fun because you had all your yellow papers everywhere, and it was like, okay, because I, I was like, I need to know the vision that you have. You need to define the vision, the mission, and when you define that, then we defined, you know, this is how we're going to behave to reach this vision. And, and when, I came to, when I came to Skyline, I, you don't know what you don't know, but I, I, I feel I was in a very healthy, very healthy culture at, at Santa Fe Christian. And how we interacted with different departments was so healthy and how we shared and like, okay, what's best, you know? And through that whole process, I look back and I go, okay, God, that's what you were trying to do. Prepare me for these things here. And so when I came to, when I came to Skyline, I came in and it was like, everybody was off on their own. And I'm like, what in the world? We can't know, like this can't happen. Like how there's, there's zero, there's lack of communication. So we started, we started building structure, and and one of them is is accountability. And we have six things that we really pour our pour our focus in of how we behave around here. And one of them is accountability. And so under that structure, it's a it's an accountability of of helping each other win, and it's not a dictatorship accountability. And so the one on ones was just the first part of like, you know, coming because some people when they go to the principal's office or executive pastor or whatever, they feel like they're in trouble. And it's like, man, we got to break down those barriers because I don't want anyone to ever feel, and my, my whole philosophy is that whenever someone leaves my office, I want them fired up to go do their job. I want them to know where they're supported. And so in those structures, one of many things was the one-on-one -on -one meetings. And I had a lot of direct reports to start with, but I think it was so beneficial because I got to know everybody. And then, then all of a sudden, COVID hits. And I think when COVID hit, we were a tight team by that yeah, time. Yeah. And we were able to go through COVID. And then once COVID, once we opened up, and then all of a sudden, we started getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And it was like our, our team was stretched mm -hmm. big time. But we st stayed together because of culture. And we stayed together, and we focused on how we behave through all of this. And then, and then we grew, and then we were able to get – people and our we don't hire fast and so it's like no we want the right people and even yesterday man I was telling my wife I was just like man our our team is awesome like our team is awesome and I look around that place and one of the best things for me and it goes back to teams is this is a place I got to hire people that were my weaknesses and so I'm like when I said at the beginning this is all I could do you're like, okay, now go hire these people. And it's just like the freedom, you know, I don't want to give you compliment too much, but the freedom that you we'll gave edit it in. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> the freedom that you gave me to do my job is is so amazing. And that trickles down to everybody else because I want to give them freedom to do their job and on and on and on. And what's happened as a result of this, all these ideas that we get, now we have to shuffle like, okay, we got to hold on this one, but we have like tons of ideas because we've allowed that environment for each person to, to come out and give it to us. And that's part of, I think what you said earlier too, is when they come to your office, it's not coming to the principal's office, but you are literally helping them understand you're here to help them win. Yeah. And that's made the difference for these ideas that are coming forth because it used to be more of a, you know, sit and watch, which is natural in so many places. You sit and wait for some someone to tell you what to do. Yep. 
and it's the here it's the bottom up in that sense. They're really bringing ideas and bringing how, how can we do this better? And here, here's an event we can do to reach more people, and and that's the culture. Yeah, and that's, I, I I just <laughs> feel like that the most exciting thing for me coming to a place like this is or a position like this is to help define rules because I feel like in every organization, most, they make rules for the weak. Hmm. And so they, they, they put the strong in, 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 in a box. Yeah. And I'm like, no, that's opposite. We do our jobs, right? And so, you know, if, if you have to leave early or you have to do this, okay, but are you getting your job done? Like, that's what you're going to be you know, judged on and how you're doing your job, how you're behaving towards it. Like, are you fired up to do your job? And as a result of that, sometimes we have to be like, okay, it's time to go home. You need a day off. You know, that's where we are right now, where some people it's like, man, you need to slow down a little bit. (laughs) So that's been cool. Which is so great to be able to say that to people instead of yes. always trying to kick them totally. to get going it's hey hold on have you taken your vacation have you you know that's what's so exciting and so to go back to some of the basketball stuff you're in a season now where you've built this program for 17 years 18 how long has it been i think 17 17 years now mm-hmm. you've won uh league titles you've won a state title and part of your your goals and ambition. Here's a small Christian college. Mm-hmm. Doesn't go out and do the things that some of these other bigger schools do in terms of attracting big talent. You got you stick to what you've talked about: culture, doing things the right way, playing the right way, having kids that have Christ-like character. Um, and here you are now in a situation where you're you're ranked in the county, you're top ten in the county, and you're now in the open division, the big division in San Diego and you're coming into the playoffs now uh, we don't have to say the name of uh, of the team or whatever that you're you're going up against but it's going to be a tough environment yeah how are you preparing those guys all this training and everything else but it, this is a top team in the county that you're playing in the playoffs in the open division a long time goal and the environment you're going into is not going to be anything like Christian if you will yeah so <laughs> So I, th- I would go back about eight or nine years, and you know when we started the program 17 years ago, we came up with a vision, and and the vision was like again I go back to what I was talking about. I want I want to compete against the best. Like I don't want to just compete against schools our size. I want to compete against the best. And and I would call schools, big schools, and they'd be going, No, who are you? Who are you? Who are you? You're a Division Five school. That, well, see, I've changed kind of the 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 whole way they do it, and it's not based on enrollment anymore. And, and a lot of small schools... It's based on, on your performance, you right? Yeah. yeah. And a lot of small schools were complaining, and I'm like, no, this is our chance, and this is our opportunity. And, and so, but I, I felt like we were competing against top teams, so I was like, it's time for the vision to change. And so about eight, nine years ago, the vision became to win a CIF championship at the highest level while making God look good. And so it's a two-part vision, and... And I'm like, the reason why we want to be at the top stage is so people can look at us and go, what is different about them? Yeah. And, and that's, been, that's hard. I mean, to train your guys in a competitive environment to be like, you know, we, here's how you honor God. You don't honor God by um, not playing hard. You honor God by giving it your best, sharing the ball, like being a true team, how you walk in, all those things. And so we can't control 100% when you see our championship at the highest level. That's a God thing. We want a big vision because, and it's just like here, we want a big vision. So when it gets accomplished, only God gets the credit for it. Like we can't get the credit. There's no way this should happen. And, and when that opportunity comes, it's like, man, it's our opportunity to give, give God the credit. Well, in those eight years, I mean, We've, we've taken steps towards that. I mean, we've won three Division I championships. We've won a state championship. But we haven't won the Open, which is the top eight teams in San Diego. And so here we are sitting in this position, and then all of a sudden we're going to a very, very, very tough environment that, 
you know, if you've ever been at a sporting event, it's, it's good. They're going to, they're going to be physical. They're going to say things to us. The crowd's going to be saying things to us. And I'm telling our guys, this is the second part of the vision. And we actually control that part of the vision while making God look good. So as we go into this, and it's for me as well, I mean, I'm a competitive guy. And so the vision is always on our minds. And, and so we talked about David and went through that journey and like he ran to the fight he didn't run away from the fight but he ran towards the fight and then defined what fight is Mm -hmm. and but again if you don't have a vision and you don't have a vision for where you're going and you don't have a god can change that vision god can alter that vision but i think if it's set and it's always on your mind you you then you do all the things to train up for that vision right and so as we prepare, we're not just preparing to win the game. We're also preparing to make God look good because it's the two-part vision. Yeah, and that's something there. When you, you talk about keeping everybody on, on track with that vision, as we mentioned earlier, we are talking a little bit about that idea that, you know, here you have a vision statement. You have it, we, you know, with basketball and these students, and you're trying to keep them, you know, on, on track with that vision. But that is an everyday thing. And I think with, with businesses, with churches, pastors and all that, it's like, well, I came up with a vision statement. You know, we even put it on the wall, but that constant practice, right? And at your practices, you're constantly pushing those same things. And that's here, our practices every day, our staff meetings, our meetings, uh, the one-on-one meetings, all of that stuff is part of keeping everybody on track. The one thing leaders have to be is clear. And that's part of having that vision statement. And then those, state, the, those steps that you talked about, I don't know anybody that has core behaviors. Mm-hmm. Like we have core behaviors mm-hmm. because that's something you brought to the table to say, this is how we act to get to that point. And that's the missing, the missing piece in so many organizations is they don't have that piece. Okay, well, how do I get there? I, I like that. I like that vision up on the wall. That's awesome. How in the world do I get there? And that's where I think... People come up with uh, vision statements and everything else, and it gets exhausting. Mm -hmm. And you touched on it a little bit earlier that you know it works, and that's what energizes, Mm -hmm. and that's why you fight for it. And so you guys are coming into this environment, and one of the things people don't know, because you would never say it, but I'll say it, is that you're San Diego County Coach of the Year, not a few years ago, and if you're not Coach of the Year this year, there's a problem. And so that's something that you've, you know, continued to uh, pour into these kids, and people are noticing that. 17 years later, that's something. All this, like, tilling of the soil over all these years, now you're starting to get noticed a little bit in terms of the programs getting noticed. I think about uh, some, of those, some of those coaches you played against that it, it wasn't pretty, but they came up and said, man, and you won, and someone would tell you you guys did it the right way. Yeah. And you keep doing it the right best way. Best compliment. Yeah, that's the best compliment you can For make. Sure. Even, even some of your former, I mean, you don't, you know, enemies are, are at least competitively, are coming back and, and wanting to learn from you. Yeah. I mean, that's part of, talk about the longevity of what you're doing and just how you're able to even get back to some of these other people. I just, don't, I just don't think people don't know what they don't know. And sometimes when you're in a negative environment or unhealthy environment, you you don't know it. And when you're in a healthy environment, sometimes you don't know it, but I've been in healthy environments pretty much my whole life. Yeah. So now I can identify what's healthy and, and what's not healthy. But when it comes like to vision, like we call that the, the telescope and you look at it, but the microscope is what are you doing every single day to get there? But the but the the biggest joy for me, I mean, I got a text from a, from a player that that is at Ohio State, and he's he's on the he's on the team and um, like the practice squad, and he's you know he's working to walk on and different thing, and that's a big time high level place. And he sent me a text the other day, and it was like, hey, coach, the 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 core behaviors that we learned, I didn't understand. I wish I wish the I wish the program that I was in now had those things. Mm-hmm. I didn't understand it, the value of those things. And this can translate to every area of life. And I'm like, 
that's it. And a lot of times you just don't realize it until you're in a situation where you look and you're like, that's not okay. Like, that's not what, and that's what I want for these kids because sometimes you don't understand what you don't know. And, and ultimately, and you talk about it all the time, healthy things grow. And so, you know, we want to, we have a big time vision here, you know, 10, 10, 10. And my goal in my role is that when we get there, we're healthy. Because I've, I've just, it saddens me that too many churches, they get to this big time place and they're unhealthy and, and then it falls apart. And it's like my, my fight in me is that, man, that's, that's the desire for me and that's the desire for our team and to find the right people that are healthy and to pour into them and to make sure they continue to be healthy because that's when it's, that's when it's so much fun. Now, you mentioned that these churches that are falling apart, there are, you know, we're not going to name them, but um, people, you know, they're everywhere. Large churches that had incredible ministries that, um, you know, we've been able to get close to some of these people, Mm -hmm. lead pastors, executive pastors, and talk to them about what is going wrong or what has Mm -hmm. gone wrong. What were some of the nuggets that you found in those situations? I'll be honest, and, and again, I was oblivious to to, you know, I mean, I, I know church, I've grown up in church, uh, been in the inside church with my dad and different things. And, and so know all those things, but you, you, you know, you don't know what you don't know until you're, you're working in an environment. And so there, I've been to a lot of different executive pastor conference and I've walked away sad, to be honest, yeah. because I'm just like story after story after story of how unhealthy and how this has happened and how a board member does this and how uh, uh, this this person treats this person this way and it's just not fun to go to and I'm just sitting there and that you know then they come to us and I'm like I actually love going to work and I think our I think our place is healthy we have problems but we we talk about them we you know, we want to create an environment when we talk about them. It's not like you're getting fired. No, it's let's let's get you back on the core behaviors. And it's not me. We all signed up for this. And so you go back to, again, the culture that we all signed up. And to me, it's a great teaching moment to get to to, to move on to the next thing. And so, um, yeah, I mean, those those have been, you know, they, they've been helpful in some ways, but sad in, in, in some other ways. Yeah, and that's something that, that's why I think, you know, we see these other churches, we see these other places, uh, we want to learn from everybody. That's the other thing, too. We don't pretend like we know it all. We Correct. certainly are growing, and we're learning, and, and all of that, but our attitude is, is you know, starts with our very first one, is, is having that humble attitude and being able to say, man, we're going to learn from, from anyone, and that's, that's an attitude you've had all throughout, even taking this role on. That was a big learning curve in a lot of ways. Totally. And, and t- just talk about some of that, you first coming on and even settling in that role and that whole process. Of- That's awesome. So, so when I went through at Santa Fe and became athletic director, I was there as athletic director for a while, and it was a massive stretching for me, massive, because there was so much more responsibility. And I even remember... You know, when things got really hard, I got on my knees and I said, God, I don't care if I get fired. I'm just, I'm, I, I don't care. And I remember when I said amen, this load lifted and said, okay, now just go do your job. Don't care what other, and I remember since then I, I was free and, and learned and all this. And, and I remember I came to a point, and when all this started coming around, I was at a point where I was like, I want to be stretched again. And that was a big draw to me to hear because I knew I was going to be stretched. And, and I cannot tell you how God has been one step ahead of me. He hasn't been five steps. It's always been one. Sometimes the morning of when I'm driving to work and I listen to a lot of podcasts and I have books and, and, and it's just like, that's it. That's it. And you can't tell me that oh, that stuff's coincidental. I mean, it is that, it, that to me is part of the call. And then it's like, okay, God, what's next? What, I, this is where I'm at. And, um, and so that, that has been a big time stretching and continues to be. And as we grow and continue to grow, there's, it doesn't become easier. It actually becomes more complicated in different ways. And then my job is to take the complex and make simple 
and try and get people in the right spots. And, and, and so a lot of, a lot of learning, I love learning. I love seeing what other people do. And, um, that's, that's been, that's been a big stretching for me. I think that's the key. Whenever we're willing to learn, like we're going to grow if we're willing to do that. But so many people get to a point in their life where they think they know it all. And that goes back to our core behaviors, which our number one thing is humble attitude of gratitude. And one. if if we're not willing to learn, you're really not, that's not part of our culture. And so when people get to that point, we can talk to them, why aren't you learning? It, it goes back to, that's the number one thing we are. If people come defensive, people come this, it goes, no, that's not who we are. We're, we're humble. And I'm not coming at you, you know, let's yeah. have these conversations. And the teaching of those things has broken down the walls of so much that it, that has helped. Which is the first thing we look for in a, in yes. a potential staff member. For sure. Are they humble? I mean, that's mm-hmm. the first one. That doesn't mean they don't talk about what they've done, or sure. how do they talk about that? How yep. do they go about that? And that's what we're looking for because anybody who comes on our team that's humble, wow, we know they're going to grow. Yep. They're going to learn. I'll never forget, it wasn't that long ago, I was talking to a pastor who um, written a lot of books and and I asked him the question I ask a lot of leaders is, what are you reading right now? And I'm like, hey, what are you reading? And he goes, I don't read books. I write them. And I was just like, uh, okay. Wow. And I just thought, that's not good. It's not good. And honestly, a year later, he was out of his pastorate. Wow. And that was just kind of like a thought. To, that first, like, first of all, that's not humble. But secondly, that's not a learner. You just want to pontificate. You just want to write all the time and just tell people what to do. You got to keep learning. Or that stuff's not as effective. What are some of the things you do to keep learning? I listen to a ton of podcasts. Um, I, I listen to books. And, and it's really a lot on leadership. But definitely in, you know, there, there's so much material out there. I mean, so much material out there. But all of those things happen. But I'm telling you, man, there, there's been so many awesome things from just even my daily devotion that has popped out that's like, oh my goodness, that's for today. And so I just think it's just all of that. I think, um, um, it, it, and again, it, it fills my soul because I wanna help people, I wanna be able to coach people, and if there's things that people need to know, I know God, again, is one step ahead, and if I'm not looking for it, I'm not gonna find it. Yeah. And so um, I, <laughs> I don't know. I, Again, goes back to your first questions of watching my dad on the farm, and and it's just this mentality that you, you got a job to do, you got to do it, and then you just say, man, it, it's you want to you want to be in an environment where where it it rises and falls on on what you do. It's okay if it falls, but y- it's not okay if it falls if you're not going after it. Yeah. And so there's you know, and this is this is the environment you have created, and that's a big, you know, I mean, we're competitive and. And gone back a long, long time. And so we know how to fight and we know how to talk to each other and we know how to do those things, which at the end, I, it's amazing how we balance each other out mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. And, and that doesn't work unless you have humility, right? And it doesn't work if it's like you get offended when, you know, you're told something or this. It's like, no, man, it goes back to the vision. This is how we get to the vision. This is what we need to do. And it's like, Oh, yeah, that makes sense. We've all bought into that. And so that's, you know, again, when it goes back to culture, man, that's, that's just the environment you want to create. And once you create it, then you got to fight for it. And you got to absolutely fight Every for day. it. Every day. <laughs> Every single day. I was a I, good buddy, Dave Roberts. I know he's a Dodger guy. But one question I asked him, man, is, is culture. And he goes, man, I said, I said, what is the hardest thing about coaching? And he turned and he goes, the Playing hardest, the Padres. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it, right. and he right. did bring no, that up. He did that, bring that up. <laughs> he said the hardest thing about coaching is you spend all this time creating a culture, and it can go away like that. Yeah. And it's like it's just a constant reminder that it's like, man, when you see something, we got to address it, and we got to address it in the right way to change behavior because if that keeps piling up, you know, I look at our mission, lives are at stake. Yeah. Eternity right. is at stake. And this is why I keep reminding our staff is like, whoa, I mean, before you go down that path, step back, go back to level one mm-hmm. and understand what's at stake here. And that's, that was a hesitant coming here as well is like, this is, this is, this is a mission that's, that's, that's greater than anything. High stakes. Yeah. 
Well, we've got to get Pastor Chad off to his basketball practice. This guy works his tail off. We talk about work ethic. He either gets up before he comes in the office here for about 7 a.m. He's got practice going, or he goes to practice afterwards or a game or whatever. And so we're going to usher him off. But I think one question that, that you know, people want to know is, as the second best golf player in this room, how do you really just deal with that? And how do you deal with, mm -hmm. you know, just you're no good at pickleball either. You're no good at racket sports. And so, like, just – just from the standpoint of me beating you all the time in sports. Yeah. Oh, you're talking you, – because Tiger – Tiger Woods is over there. Because <laughs> that's the only guy, you know, if – Oh, I, got, oh, I see. I actually, I actually have the career record. 26 of, years. 3,425 yeah, wins golf. for me. 26 years. And you have 700. Golf. So we so played how many times? It's a four-to-one In 26,000 times. So for every four times. Cheated every time. Times. You cheated every, every time. <laughs> so if I've you play won, straight up, you've won then I'm holes. the champion. So it's good having so, you here thanks. on this particular podcast. And folks on Faith and Culture, join us as we continue to find out how do we implement our faith in our current culture. And just we want to learn, we want to grow. God bless you guys. We'll see you next time.